Well, while the argument between you and Candace continues on, there's all sorts of commotion mm -hmm. going on at the bar. Yeah. Brother, you need to control your wife. She's out of control. You need to control. It's not, it's not good for us. Michael, you should get the f out of my face. Shut the f up and listen to what I'm saying. Yo, what? What are you, you touching me? You touching me? What? Look, I could barely hear what was going on because Candace was yelling at me so loud. I'm literally mid yell, okay? I'm mid emotion here. And I just, I hear this ruckus to the back left of me. And I was like, dang, Robert, your guest is turning up. I looked up and I could see producers like looking past us. Like they're like, you know, got their little walkie, whatever. And, <laughs> and I looked around and I'm like, oh, okay, great. So I had no idea what was going on, but what was going on was another fight, if you will, or a fuss. And I wanted nothing to do with it. I mean, you know, one fight, you know, shame on us. Two, shame on me for staying around and being involved with it. And I craned my neck and I saw my husband's head just doing this. And I was like, oh, I gotta go. It's time, it's time to go. I gotta get up. My husband doesn't get upset. He doesn't get angry. He's not agitated easily unless he's talking to me because, you know, I'm his wife. But just outside of me, he doesn't get perturbed easily. When I saw his face, like, I you was, knew. I knew. I was so, I got upset. For, I didn't even know what happened, but I was upset for him because it's like, mm. who, who is messing with my man? And I get to him and I, I then I realized what was going on. And it's just, and then it's like, okay, Michael fucking Darby. Like, you literally just can't, you can't get right. You just can't get right. When I heard, like, commotion and I heard someone say Michael, when I say a fight or flight response kicked in, it was like, what? I mean, I wanted to jump across that booth and get involved in whatever was going on. And at that time, I didn't care who it was. I didn't care if Michael was d getting into a fight with Juan. I didn't care if he was fighting, he could have been fighting Chris Samuels. I would have put myself in there. That liquid courage, I mean, it comes about every now and again, but it was very strong right then. Because, you know, now that Michael is more than my husband, he's also the father of my son, I'm super protective of him now. I guess he saw me getting upset with Karen and he gets upset that I'm upset enough to go over to my husband and show his ass you need to control your wife the only thing controlling Candace is Jesus okay my husband don't control me and I'm sorry for any man if, a, if another man comes to you and says you need to do this for your wife like what those those are that's I don't want to call them fighting words but that's a no-no you, you, you're coming up to <laughs> another man to say to another man, control your wife. What? Where are they doing that? In your house? Keep that in your house. And nothing is controlled over here. Well, you and Ashley also then start to kind of get into it. So, so Monique has no self-control, but what do you have? You have no self-control, do you? Without even knowing what's going on, she wants to charge, she charged at me. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, what? Do you even know what went down? I actually have no recollection of that. I have no recollection of talking to Candace after the Chris and Michael incident. I don't know if it was adrenaline or what, but I have no recollection of saying anything else to her. This, this whole scene just paint, it's a metaphor for their lives together. This is why you are in this predicament that you're in now with this man who continues to disrespect you and embarrass the dog crap out of you publicly because you blindly follow his lead over a cliff. Quite frankly, I don't think Monique is justified in getting physical with Candace. Just like I don't think that Chris is justified in putting his hands on my husband. And with all of the aggression and the animosity that Candace and Chris feel toward Monique, they're actually doing the exact same thing that she did, and yet they want to cry wolf about the incident. Again, Monique was wrong, but so was Chris. And two wrongs don't make a right. Chris Bassett wanted no parts of any trouble. 
Like he was over in the corner. He was minding his business. For Michael to just like basically roll up on him and he was like egging him on for an altercation. Chris Bassett emailed me. I mean, um, texted me, called me. I talked to Candace and Chris together on the phone after the party. He was so apologetic for that scene, for that, for that happening at that party. He felt so bad. But of course, Michael, we don't hear anything from him. There's no apology from him. And then for Michael to want to cuss out the entire production team was like, dude. <laughs> You didn't cross the line and you need to go. And like, don't come back. I mean, so disrespectful. I mean, I get it. He had a rough season four. He probably has held on to that animosity, but like, dude, you did what you did. Like, you know, it's, it's the only person to be mad at is yourself. So, um, I don't know. I mean, but clearly he's a loose cannon. Yeah. I think it's disrespectful to Ashley. I mean, you know, Ashley, I'm sure doesn't go to his, his place of business and act a fool. For me, the biggest, why I felt like it was important to leave it in, I just know our ladies, they're gonna talk about it. They are gonna talk about it, whether it's at the reunion, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's in a blog. And there were other people there who witnessed it. I never wanted to feel like I'm hiding anything from the viewers. I feel bad for her. I just, I feel bad for her. Cause she is, she's literally made into a fool every year on the show because of him. We see you talk to your therapist, Esther. It's like I'm in a circle of women who I still feel like I'm trying to prove to them who I am. Yeah. Um, to the point where I feel like I'm always in defense mode. I think because I am the middle child, maybe I have a little middle child syndrome as they like to call it, but I always had to fight for the attention. I always had to fight to you know, be seen or get my point across, or I just always felt like I had to prove that, you know, I'm worth it, I'm here. It might not be ex exciting because I didn't go through it first or last, but I'm going through it, <laughs> you know? So a lot of how I am with people is because of whatever I feel like I didn't get when I was growing up or how I felt I wasn't really paid attention to as much as I would have liked from, you know, my family. Where does all the defensiveness come from though? I mean, just being young and just kind of being bullied. I went from one neighborhood where it was predominantly white, me, my sister, and another child, we were the only black kids at the entire school. And um, I remember being out on the playground one day and one of the girls, I hate talking about this. At that point in time, I didn't even know what black was. I was just a person and She's like, well, we like you. We want to play with you, but we can't because you're black. And I'm like, wait, what? What's that mean? And she's like, well, yeah, look at your hair. And I just felt like out of place. So then I think my parents started recognizing that. And they're like, okay, we're going to buy a house. We're going to go to a nice neighborhood. It's more predominantly black. And I started going to a black school. So I'm excited. I'm the new kid once again. And then it was just like I got iced out because... Oh, she's smart. Oh, she talks proper. Oh, you act like a white girl. And it was just like, wow, <laughs> I can't win for losing. It was like, I couldn't even find my place in any environment that I was in. So, and I think a lot of that treatment also stems to how I am as an adult, um, a person who wants to show people that, you know, I just want to pe I just want people to know that I'm worth it and I love who I am and I don't apologize for it. And that's why I'm so adamant with my daughter to make sure that she loves herself the way I love myself and screw anybody who doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. So I found myself more so gravitating to I'm, a, I'm an animal lover. 
I had every animal you can think of. <laughs> and I found myself gravitating more to my pets because they didn't judge me. They were happy when I came home. You know, they were happy to cuddle with me. It didn't matter. So I became a person who trusted people very less and less. And I think that because of that history, it definitely stems into my adult life because when I do feel like I found a friend and I trust that person and then I'm betrayed by that person, it's like I'm feeling that same childhood pain all over again. And to some extent, I think that I attract people who are damaged because I'm always wanting to rescue somebody who I see may be the outcast, which is why when I asked Candace in Newburg, we had that whole questioning game that we did. And I said, what was, what was it like growing up in school for you? And when she said she was the only brown girl, I immediately realized why our friendship was how it is. And what, I, I immediately realized what attracted me to her. It was the fact that we're two people who are hurting. And all we did was keep hurting each other. So. It's just a bad cycle, you know, and just trying to break that cycle through therapy has helped me to recognize it and then I can move forward. So when I say this is more than just a show, this is real life. I really wanted to get down to the bottom of what was going on to make me always feel like I'm guarded or needing to defend myself. The wig shift party. Okay. There's some discrepancy in the text messages and the timing of the whole thing. But it seemed like everybody had connected the dots and realized that you invited Monique and Candace to come early at the same time. And because of that, you decided to exit. No, that's not true. <sighs> you know what? I probably was at that, at Robin's party, all of five hot seconds <laughs> in my mind before the whole group just, you know, I call it gang banging. They like to come together and attack me in a group. What a reception. Attacked by the banshees. I was, I was like, you know what, but y'all, y'all didn't disappoint me. I knew that it had to be something, you know, poor things. When would they learn? There was no discrepancy. Uh, I called Candace, I believe, if I get it correctly, I believe I called Candace to make sure what time she was arriving. Um, I'm not a big texter. Karen called me specifically to tell me that she didn't want me to have to take off my wig in front of the group to put on one of her wigs because I had expressed to Karen several times how I felt triggered by when Monique was pull, trying to pull my wig off and my wig was glued down to my edges. So Karen knew this because we had talked about it ad, ad nauseum. We talked about it forever. And so she called to say, hey, I want you to come early. I want you to come at 5.30. She said on the phone. She said, 5.30, come. Come early so you can take, have your wig taken off in private and we can have Steven put your wig on with, before anyone else gets there. I said, okay, great. So I am a baby Robin. So I'm late number two and I'm always late. So I texted her, I don't want to get it wrong. Receipts, honey. Because I don't have a whole lot of correspondence with Karen, so it's not going to be hard to go back that far. The receipts are longer than CVS, One honey. Ish. I said, this is on December 7th, I guess the day of or the day before, and I said, tell me what time you want me to come again. She says, 6.30, please. Then she says, what's your ETA? I say 6.40 because I'm always late. But 6.30 was not the time she originally told me. She originally told me 5.30. It showed that they were going to be there at the same time. It just so happened that Candace was running late per usual. But no, she was having them get there at the same time. So when I get there and I'm talking to Ashley and Ashley's telling me that Monique had just come and that it seemed like Karen or I guess Monique had told Ashley that Karen seemed to be rushing Monique out of the party. Monique felt like she was being rushed out. That was because Karen in her whatever stupor 
had jacked up these times and knew that I was on the way. I mean, did you guys not see me breaking sweat because I had to rush my friend out of the door? Yes. I was like, oh my God. Okay. The timing was, you know, was all, was, was Karen's timing. You know, it was her event. Um, but, you know, sometimes people don't show up exactly on time. So there was not a lot of, uh, you know, sort of cushion in the um, various arrival times. Monique did arrive er early as she was supposed to, but late in terms of the time Karen wanted her to arrive. Monique was literally there for, I would say, about under 10 minutes. And then Karen tried to rush her out. And then Karen rushed her out. She went away. And then Candace arrived around, I would say, 15 minutes later. For the record, I was invited and I did not want to be there when the other ladies came, nor did Karen want there to be any conflict. So we were in agreement with that. And she maybe did or did not want us to run into each other. I have no idea. In my mind, I feel like Karen got cold feet and mm -hmm. realized what I, what I thought I was going to do. Yeah, I shouldn't really do that. And that's why she changed the time with Candace. But originally, oh, absolutely. She was trying to get them together at the same time. No question. But if she says she wanted to come at 5.15 and she was running late and I told her to come at 6.30, you know I had her back. There was a reason for me doing that to ensure that there was no butting of heads because everyone's schedule shifted that day. So that's why I said come at 6.30 and not 5.30 because I wanted to make sure that she and Monique and I was respecting their wishes not to be in the same room. So I accomplished my task. There's no fishiness there. Both Monique and both C and Candace were late from the time that Karen initially wanted them to arrive. So that's what really happened in terms of the orders of event. They were both were supposed to come at different times, but they both were late from their original time they were supposed to attend. Listen, I'm not confused about the texting messages. I'm on board. I got this under control. It's a wrap. So whatever someone's trying to do to make these girls meet and, and, and betray their faith and trust in me wasn't going to happen on my watch. So I'm not confused about any of that. <laughs> Let's talk about something happy. Juan proposing to Robin. Yay! Oh my God. And I want to try this for the second time. Okay, the room exploded. Like, people <laughs> went bonkers. Oh my goodness. So the only people who really knew were Giselle and I. We were the only, and Juan, obviously. And so people started to get a little suspicious when we gathered around. Like, you could sort of, like, hear a little whispering, like, what's gonna happen kind of thing. So people started speculating. And then when it actually happened, there was, like, an eruption. Like, literally, my eardrums, like, did a little because there was an eruption of excitement that happened. And I don't know whether they show this, but like Wendy and Candace kept looking at me like, is this happening? Is this happening? What's <laughs> happening? I had hoped that they would eventually find their way to that place. But no, I was not. I mean, Giselle did a very good job of keeping the secret very secret. And no, I did not know that that's what we were coming for. Robin, I mean, this was such a huge moment. Did you see it coming at all? I didn't. I did not. I was like, I mean, when I was like, I had the microphone and he's like about to grab it. And I'm like, what the hell is he doing? For him to like really like stand up and want to talk to people. I was like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> I'm like, what? I was like, is he going to like ask people to come to his basketball games or something? Like support his team? Like, <laughs> so yeah, it, it was, it was awesome. It was sweet. And like, you know, Juan has a great way of expressing his feelings for me, and I really appreciated that he did it um, the way he did it. But for him to propose at a, you know, in front of a whole group of people on television, I was just like, I was shocked by that. When do you lose your damn mind? I'm like, girl, first of all, <laughs> we didn't work a long time on this. Second of all, get out of the camera shot. Okay, you in the camera shot, move. Oh so I just, 
wanted Juan to say everything he wanted to say uninterrupted <laughs> by these crazy women who are losing their minds. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It's that damn vodka. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, Wendy texted me her video and all I hear is, ah, ah, yes, ah, ah, yes, yes. I'm like, Wendy, I have to put this on mute. Like, what the hell? I think Wendy just loves love too. I think she likes the idea of, I mean, it's fairly really hard not to root for Robin and Juan. You know, I know I've had my, my opinion about them in the past. And what I was saying back then was how they weren't on the same page and they, they both weren't committed to the relationship. All of that happened, and now here they are. They're about to embark on this journey again, and they both seem to be in it for the right reasons, and they finally seem to be on the same page. But it just goes to show that everybody loves love, and everybody loves a wonderful love story. So, you know, whether you've known Robin for six months or forever, like everybody was all in and so happy. You just. You just revel in the happiness of anybody. But again, mm -hmm. especially as we talk about in, you know, in 2020, the attack on the black family and the mm -hmm. way that the black family is made to suffer uh, and be seen as subordinate or broken in so many ways. And to see this black family um, sort of elevate to this new echelon of happiness and greatness and to see these black boys who will get to see their mother and father mend their relationship. It's a very unique story. So it was just a really nice, like, oh my God, I'm not gonna get emotional about it, but it was just a really nice, like, you know, just like people coming together who really love each other, even though there'd been so many obstacles to try to keep them apart. It was beautiful, yeah. Before you guys get to the holiday party, you mentioned that Juan is preparing to yes. propose to Robin. And Michael seems very, very convinced that it's not going to happen. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Juan is planning to propose to Robin. Get out of yes! here. Yes! And she showed me the ring. No way. Yeah. It's not possible. Someone's pulling your leg. Does that man will not do that? Yeah. <laughs> I am completely shocked by Michael saying these things about Juan because he's never given any indication of that to me before, that he knows something about Juan. I told Ashley in Portugal just because Karen kept saying crazy things. When I saw Giselle's ass on Instagram talking about she in front of a jewelry store, I'm like, Juan is joining her at the jewelry store. And I just felt like, I don't know what Karen is gonna do and I just need some backup with regards to the ladies in case anything goes left. And of course that would be Ashley. And she then told Michael. And Michael wasn't like super happy from what I understand. Michael was like, huh, what? That ain't gonna happen. He even questioned me about it once he got there. Juan has been reluctant previously to commit, as we all know. Okay, I, I have to go check on Juan Dixon. Cause it's happening. Maybe it won't. I just, didn't get it. I just felt like it was very unsupportive. And, you know, I know he's got like some, some special feelings when it comes to Juan, <laughs> but I thought he would put those feelings to the side in order to be happy for Robin and Juan. Like, come on. <laughs> this is like a long, this is like years in the making here, sir. Oh my gosh. I felt like I was monkey in the middle because, you know, I love my husband. And I support my husband always. But this is one area where we had a very different opinion. To me, I felt like Juan had had some time to reevaluate his priorities and he realized that at the end of the day when everything came down to it, Robin was the one who had been by him, who had stuck by him, and this is where he wants to spend the rest of his life. So I, you know, being the romantic that I am, I want this fairy tale to happen. But upon asking him later what he meant, he says that he meant that Juan has been not married to Robin for so long and everything has been fine. They've been living together. Everything has been functioning normally. Why would Juan feel the pressure to get married now? He said a man is not going to necessarily think he has to do that unless 
Someone is telling him he has to do that. Oh, I just didn't know. I wanted to be happy and be present in the moment and smile and laugh and cry tears of joy. And here Michael is saying, well, I don't know. You know, it's like, oh, what do I do? Very weird. Yeah. Maybe when when felt, did that happen? You know what? Uh -huh. Like maybe Michael felt like, wait a minute, Juan didn't tell me this, so it can't be true. Like maybe he thought he, sh he should have known about this. Before. Like before, I don't know. And if anything, he was just being a little more uh, salacious. It obviously worked because it got Giselle riled up and I'm sure it's gonna get Robin riled up. <laughs> What was your reaction when you found out that the charges had been dropped by the court? I was very relieved. I was very excited. Thank God the charges were dropped. I wasn't surprised um, just because there wasn't a whole lot of physical damage that was done. And then I know that Monique filing that countersuit was a strategic move. Like, yeah. I, you know, I think it's like when stuff like that happens, like that's in order to get them to like throw the cases out. I believe I was in Mexico. Yeah, I was in Cozumel on a family vacation. And um, that's when uh, one of my Bravo besties, Portia joined me out there with her family and her daughter. And and it was just really nice. And it's so crazy because Portia had been in an incident as well some years back. So for me to get that news and I'm sitting next to her, <laughs> it was just like, wow. And she's been so uh, supportive and just encouraging me. And it's been great to have that bond. But I was just very relieved because it was just something that was already so heavy. And then to know what the possible outcome could be and for things to keep getting dragged out further and further, I just wanted it to be done. I was disappointed for Candace because I know that that did not offer her the closure that she needed, but it also at least was like, okay, like I can move on from this. Yeah, I felt like from a judge's perspective, you know, these are two women that are on reality television. I'm sure their view of reality television is, you know, this is what you signed up for, getting smashed in the face. I mean, I don't know, you know, it depends on who the judge is. So I felt, I wasn't surprised, but I, yeah, like, like Robin said, I felt really horrible for Candace. I felt like, you know, she does need to see some sort of win out of this in some capacity. The first thing that came to mind was the musical stylings of Monique Samuels. <laughs> and it's like, just when you think that it can't get any more comical and disgusting, that happens. By no means do we want to see Monique do jail time, but you know, it would have been nice for her to have some sort of repercussion or some sort of something right. that would... Even even if it was like, okay, you have to make a public statement apologizing or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like something. Something. Like at least acknowledge that this took place and that something needs to happen, so. I think the, the only resolution and really the most important resolution of them all is the one that I've had internally, is that I have come to a place of kind of a little bit of peace with everything. And then especially kind of seeing everything play out and watching the court of public opinion shift uh, in line with the truth, the, the actual and real truth has been very cathartic and very, um, very, I don't know what this is, but this word, it's been very ha for me. So that's that for me, that's the only resolution in all of this that really matters. No story about me could start and distract, you know, take away from her celebration. But we'll see how that goes. No, no. She I wasn't going to come. She didn't feel like it. It was all this drama with her. And it was like, girl, if you don't want to come, don't come. 